Somos, oh Señor, ayúdanos a encaminar injusticia, sabrá, Señor, dolor y amargura. Todos los mineros, Señor, buscaremos la justicia, explotados y maltratados. Ayúdanos, Señor, apiádate, oh mi Señor, del pueblo minero. Humildemente te pedimos salvación, liberación. Welcome to the third podcast of Weaving the Blanket, Stories of Faith, Sacrifice, and Martyrdom and the Emancipation of the Evangelical Methodist Church of Bolivia. This episode is entitled, Cerro Rico, Envy of Kings. I am David Stevenson. As I said last week, before we go to the incredible and individual stories of the people of the Evangelical Methodist Church of Bolivia, or the IEMB, we need to know the context in which they lived. Last week, we spoke about the Conquistadors' massacre of the Inca Quechuas and the 500 years of violent evangelism. For the next two podcasts, we're going to take a, a little divergence. We're going to learn about the amazing story of Cerro Rico, the Rich Hill, which is considered by most historians as the single most important mine in the history of the world. We'll begin with Cerro Rico. The Envy of King. When Bizarro was looking for investors who would fund his expeditions, it was the hope, the promise, that he would find gold and silver in this great unexplored land south of Panama. Cortez had conquered Mexico and pillaged the gold and silver which was there. The Spanish had started construction of mines and were shipping the ore back to Spain. Millionaires were being created. Pizarro and his investors believed that they would find similar riches to the south. They had no idea how huge the wealth that was awaiting them, a wealth that would transform the world. Pizarro had been awed by the amount of gold and silver he received that was supposed to ransom the life of Atahuapa. As we heard last week, three rooms, 22 feet by 17 feet, were filled, two with silver, one with gold. It made the equivalent of instant millionaires of most of the men who were on the trip including the priest Valverde. Of course, it set off a Spanish gold and silver rush. Conquistadors began to flow into South America, searching for gold and silver that they could loot from the villages they conquered. Silver in those days was just as valuable as gold. The conquistadors followed the trail of gold and silver, conquering and subjecting every village along the way. The king of Spain, recognizing the potential for this extreme wealth, quickly colonized most of South America and established the part that included all of Upper Peru, which includes all of present-day Bolivia. Soon the conquistadors discovered the River of Gold. Panning the gold and silver from this river was already a large industry by the Quechua Inca before the Spanish arrived. The massive amounts of gold and silver which the Spanish looted in Cachamarca came from this area. There was such large amounts of gold and silver simply available by being looted along the way that it took 12 years for them to reach the mountain from which this wealth was flowing. There are two somewhat competing stories about the beginning of the mining at Cerro Rico. One story says that there are indications that some crude ancient forms of mining have occurred at Cerro Rico since the 2nd century A.D., 
which would mean that it occurred even before the Quechua Incas invaded the Aymara. The second story, which may be more myth than fact, but it is more interesting. There is a story that after the arrival of the Spanish in Bolivia, a local Quechua Inca man named Diego Wapa was out looking for a llama that had wandered off. As it became dark, he decided to stop and build a fire to cook his dinner. It so happened that he had stopped at the foot of a mountain known in Quechua as Potosí. Diego's fire grew so hot that the very earth beneath it started to melt and a shiny liquid oozed from the ground. Diego immediately realized that he'd run across a commodity for which the Spanish conquistadors had an insatiable appetite. Perhaps he also remembered the Inca legend associated with the mountain, in which the Inca Juana Capac had been instructed by a booming voice not to dig into the hill of Potosí, but to leave the metal alone because it was intended for others. <laughs> to me, this sounds like a Spanish-created mythology to justify the Spanish plunder of the silver of Cerro Rico. Whatever the truth of this is, the Spanish eventually heard of this mountain called Potosí and raced to check it out. By the end of April 1545, the imperial city of Charles V was founded at the foot of Cerro Rico, and large-scale excavation began. They named the city Potosí. Within months, thousands of indentured indigenous slaves were digging into the mountain. They named the mountain Cerro Rico, the Rich Hill. But in Europe, it soon became known as, quote, the Envy of Kings, unquote. Cerro Rico is located in a desolate area at 15,000 feet in altitude. This is at the upper edge of where people can work and work without oxygen masks. Young men from the Spanish elite came and made their fortunes from the gold and silver of Cerro Rico. With the discoveries of silver and gold on nearby mountains, it soon became obvious that it was in the middle of a great silver belt with massive deposits of silver located both east and west of Cerro Rico in places like Mesa de Plata, Porco, and Pulacoyo. However, it was Cerro Rico, the rich hill, that was keen. Cerro Rico is a mountain made up of silver. It is the richest source of silver in the history of the world. Normally, silver veins running through a mountain are minuscule. I found a report from 1925 that described a promising mine in Arizona, which produced 25 ounces of silver per ton of rock mined and how profitable it would be. However, at Cerro Rico, there were silver veins which were as much as 12 feet thick and of nearly pure silver. All it had to do is to be extracted from the rock. Bolivia, along with the conquered silver mines of Mexico, nearly doubled the entire world supply of refined silver, as well as providing vast amounts of gold. In all the pirate movies you've seen, have you ever noticed that the pirates raid ships and steal gold and silver coins that are being carried by the Spanish ships? Doesn't it seem odd that there are boatloads of silver and gold coins floating around in the Caribbean? You would think the ships would be full of silver ore being sent back to Spain to be refined and turned into coins in Spanish mints. But the image of the movies is correct. Most of the gold and silver that was stolen by the pirates were coins. The reason was that the amount of silver and gold was so staggering that the Spanish government decided it could not afford to ship the silver and gold ore to Spain. There was just too much of it. So they decided to create three Spanish mints in the New World one in Mexico City, one in Lima, and the third was the Casa de Moneda in Potosi, Bolivia, at the base of Cerro Rico. These mints refined and minted gold and silver coins, which would be easier and cheaper to transport back to Spain. This actually proved to be a gift to Bolivia. 
In general, the tin, iron, and other basic raw materials taken out of the rich deposits of the Bolivian Andes were never refined in Bolivia. For centuries, up to and including today, the standard practice is to take the raw resources from Bolivia, pay as little as possible to Bolivian workers and Bolivian society, and then to refine and improve upon them in their home country. The effect was to rob Bolivia of its wealth, leaving behind very, very little. If those resources could be refined and developed in the country before they were exported, this value-added production would add tremendously to the Bolivian economy. This is precisely what happened with silver in Bolivia in the 16th and 17th and 18th centuries. The city of Potosí exploded in population and wealth. Potosí was built in the incredibly beautiful colonial style. Over 80 churches were built, most with elaborate silver altars. It developed a reputation as a typical gold rush, or in this case, silver rush, boomtown. Greed, easy money, prostitution, and duels were popular. European goods made it up the Llama Trails from Lower Peru. Miguel de Cervantes, author of Don Quixote, coined the phrase in the late 16th century, it's a potosí, which Spaniards to this day use to refer anything that is obscenely wealthy. In 1572, Potosí became the Western world's largest city with a population of over 120,000 people. It was larger than London, Paris, or Madrid. To this day, Potosí is the second largest city in the world at an altitude of 12,000 feet or more, with a population of over 100,000 inhabitants. It has only been recently eclipsed by its sister city, El Alto, Bolivia, which is 200 feet higher, and El Alto has over 1 million people living there. The gold and silver coins were shipped out of the mountains by Yama, then across Lake Titicaca, carried down the mountains by Yama caravans to the ports in Peru and Chile. From there, they were shipped either to western Panama for transportation to Panama City or to Acapulco, Mexico, and taken across the isthmus to Gulf Ports. It was from there, laden with gold doubloons and silver pieces of eight from Potosí, that the great Spanish galleons would begin their treacherous excursions through the Caribbean, trying to avoid the pirates along the way. All of this gold and silver was flowing into the coffers of the Spanish king. It built the Spanish Armada, which would soon attack England. Queen Elizabeth was desperate to slow down the Spanish buildup, so she, not so secretly, hired privateers or pirates to operate out of English ports and raid Spanish shipping and split the booty. The most famous of the pirates was Sir Francis Drake, who on March 1, 1579, captured the Spanish galleon Nuestra Señora de la Concepción. Its cargo included 26 tons of silver coins, a thousand pounds of gold coins, and various other looted treasures. Its value was the equivalent of over $200 million in today's funds. Sir Francis Drake certainly got a significant amount of the booty but most of the wealth went to the English crown. This one ship paid off the entire national debt of England with enough left over to pay for the entire national budget for the next year. Over the next 300 years, up until the 20th century, Cerro Rico provided 80% of all the silver in the world. Let me say that again. 80% of the silver in the world came from one mountain. The amount of gold and silver taken from Potosí area over the next 450 years is staggering, even by today's standards. 220 tons of silver was mined and refined each year, each year in Potosí. Cerro Rico alone has produced over 30,000 tons or 60 million pounds of pure silver. It's over $1 trillion. It made Spain the richest city in the world, all 
from one single mountain. Potosi became the busiest industrial complex in the world. Each year, the Spanish Mint manufactured 2.5 million silver coins. These coins, the famous pieces of eight, were of such size and weight that they became the first universal international currency. Silver became the key to humanity's prosperity. Now, instead of trading goods for other goods, you could actually buy things with this new international currency, the pieces of eight. A single coin was worth the equivalent of $80 today. It was a legal tender in the USA until 1857. The dollar sign was created from the pieces of eight. The capital S and the Roman numeral two, which were on the minted pieces of eight, were combined to become the symbol of the dollar. These coins united the world into a web of commerce. The pieces of eight were soon found everywhere in the world. Pieces of eight were used to pay for some of the greatest man-made wonders of the world. For example, the Taj Mahal in India was built by the Mughal emperor Shah Jahan, and he paid for the materials and he paid the workers with pieces of eight he had received in trade from Spain. With the beginning of a true worldwide trade, the whole world's economy exploded. There was an enormous burst of prosperity all over the world. A booming economy erupts in Europe and China. Major European cities explode in population and in wealth. Cities like Seville, London, and Amsterdam all become great trading centers. All of this new wealth was created in Bolivia and had an impact like no other mine in the history of humanity. It even laid the foundation for the Industrial Revolution. Many historians believe that there are four factors that came together to create the European Industrial Revolution of 1780 to 1910. First, there was a population boom, which led to urban migration. Second, new forms of power were created. Third, there was a burst of disposable wealth worldwide. And fourth, there were great engineers who designed machinery for industry. Steam power from coal had just been developed in Europe. For the first time, abundant energy was available to provide power for the large factories of Europe. And it was the great engineers of Europe and America that figured out how to harness that power and build machines to manufacture cloth and other products. But the other two ingredients to bring about the Industrial Revolution came from Bolivia. Population growth and its urban migration and the explosion of worldwide trade and the sudden presence of disposable wealth throughout the world. When the conquistadors arrived in the Altiplano in 1537, they discovered a remarkable little, tough, nutritious, portable food source called the potato. The potato is native only to the Altiplano of Bolivia and Peru. The pre-Columbian farmers first discovered and cultivated the potato plant some 7,000 years ago. Its nutritional value was immensely important to these early farmers. It was and is the staple of the Aymara and Quechua diet. And today there are over 500 varieties of potatoes grown in the Altiplano, many of them grown only in Bolivia. It wasn't until about 1570 that the conquistadors brought the hardy potato plant to Europe. They had no idea they were about to transform the continent. The reasons for the potato's popularity in Europe was that it was unlike any other major crop. Potatoes contain most of the vitamins and carbohydrates needed for sustenance. It can provide an almost complete diet for up to 10 people on a single acre of land. It spoils slowly and can be stored in the dark for months without losing nutritional value. It is relatively simple to cultivate, needing less people to work the land to produce much more food. It can even be grown in small gardens in the city. 
Throughout Europe, the most important new food in the 19th century was the potato. By 1845, one-third of the arable or farmable land in Ireland was planted with potatoes. Beginning around 1840, it is estimated that 10% of the total caloric intake of all Europeans came from the potato. Families could now grow enough potatoes to feed their family and still have enough to sell and to be able to purchase simple household goods. Large families with a lot of children were no longer needed to run the farm. In fact, having lots of children became an economic liability instead of an asset. So many grown children left and moved to the city looking for work. It was these kids moving to the cities from the farm who provided the labor force for the new factories of the Industrial Revolution. The spread of the potato and the increasing nutrition throughout Europe is generally seen as the prime factor in two of the ingredients necessary for the Industrial Revolution. First, the potato led to the population boom in the late 18th and early 19th centuries and urban migration. This growing population needed clothing and other essentials, and the urban migration provided the workers to develop the factories to provide that clothing. Second, Bolivia also provided enormous amounts of silver and wealth. First, to Spain. But as Spain began to purchase items all over the world, it provided the cash to buy things from factories and international trade to sell them. By the end of the 16th century, Upper Peru, what we now call Bolivia, was the wealthiest country in the Western Hemisphere and perhaps the world per capita. But remember, it wasn't really a country. It was owned by Spain. The Bolivian silver and gold rush was unlike the gold rushes of California and Colorado in the United States. The flow of silver and gold didn't last just for a few years. Instead, it lasted for three to four hundred years. In fact, silver and gold mining is a continually strong industry even today. By the end of the 18th century, Spain was awash in the constant flow of silver and gold from Bolivia and Mexico, primarily from Potosi. Great gold and silver cathedrals and palaces were being built all over Spain by the Spanish nobility. Bolivian silver and gold financed the Spanish Renaissance and built the famed Spanish Armada. It was the Bolivian silver and gold which bankrolled the Spanish wars against the Turks, the Italians, the Flemish, the French, and the English. That is why in Europe, Puerto Rico was known as the Envy of Kings. The silver flowing from Bolivia provided a higher standard of living, not just for the elite, but also for the masses, as the salaries and the price and profitability of food and other things began to grow. The masses had some spendable income and could afford to purchase things instead of simply barter for them. Bolivian silver could be invested in factories and was the international currency which started a worldwide economy with the flow of goods and services across the continents. These newly wealthy young Spanish nobles went searching for new ways to spend their wealth. The newest gadget, the newest clothing from the furthest locations were all the rage. The Spanish economy went looking for places to spend that money. There was so much silver and gold in Spain that runaway inflation hit the economy, but even that didn't slow them down thanks to the constant flow of new silver and gold. The rest of Europe gladly stepped in. In England, France, Germany, Italy, and elsewhere, great newfangled institutions called factories began to spring up. These factories began to produce all of the consumer goods that were so desired by the Spanish nobility and by the increasingly wealthy Spanish middle class. The vast amounts of disposable income in Spain became the target of much of the manufacturing in Europe. It appears that exporting goods to Spain, paid for by Bolivian silver and gold, was the financial engine for the Industrial Revolution in Europe. By the way, this also explains why Spain missed out on the Industrial Revolution. For centuries, Spain's manufacturing and industrial base was much less developed than the rest of Europe. This was because there was no need to build Spanish factories. They simply bought whatever they needed with Bolivian silver. So it was the Bolivian potato which provided the manpower 
and Bolivia's silver and gold, which provided the finances and international trade, which along with European developments in engineering and power that brought about the great industrial revolution in Europe. It's amazing to realize that the Bolivia potato plant increased the caloric intake and health of all of Europe, and it along with Casa de Moneda in Potosi and the mountain that supplied it brought financial prosperity and an increased standard of living, not just to the elite, not just to a single country, but increased the prosperity and the standard of living of the majority people of the entire world. That is why Cerro Rico, the envy of kings, is considered the single most important mine in the history of the world. I want to give a special thanks to Juan Carlos Cadero and his family. His family sang the opening hymn to this podcast and to last week's podcast. He also recorded the interlude music as well as the closing guitar music. We are working on a way in which you can purchase his music online, but haven't got it figured out yet. Juan Carlos is the co-producer of this series and works especially hard on the Bolivian Spanish version of the podcast. Thanks, Juan Carlos. This week on the website at www.weavingtheblanket.com, you will find at the Dig Deeper button two episodes from the Public Broadcasting Systems series, Mankind, the Story of All of Us. There is a link to a six-minute short snippet on what life was like for the Quechua Incas before the Spanish arrived, and there is also a link to the eighth episode, which tells the story of Cerro Rico and its impact on the world. You will also find a list of the sources on which I pulled together this story and a gallery of the pictures that we used in the video portion. And please rate this podcast on iTunes, like our webpage if you use it, give a thumbs up on YouTube or Facebook that you are using, It will help others to find the stories and invite others to join the podcast with you. Next week, we will hear about the inhuman catastrophic working conditions of the miners who produced all of that wealth from the mining of Cerro Rico and the horrible pollution it left behind and about how one miner outsmarted the system and became wealthy. Thanks for listening. (music) 